History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 353rd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Hey, Kelly. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing spectacular. <laughs> we have a little bit of rain going on outside and we're getting ready to set up our Halloween stuff. So what could be better? I love it. We have a spooky get together coming up in November. We do. If ever there was a meetup that you tried to get to, this is the one to do. Oh my gosh. Yes. We're going to be doing a ghost hunt at the USS North Carolina in Wilmington, North Carolina. And not only will you be able to do it along with Kelly and myself, but we have other members of the Spooktacular crew already coming. And there will be four ghost hunters with us. And I'm talking the capital ghost hunters, the reboot of ghost hunters, Rochelle, taps. <laughs> yeah, Rochelle, Brian, Mustafa and Daryl will be there as well. So it's going to be a great time. It is November 21st, 7 p.m. to midnight. Tickets are 80 bucks. If you want to join us, contact us at historyghostbump at gmail.com and we'll get you all set up. We're going to make a weekend of it. So we're going to get there Friday and do the Wilmington ghost walk and that kind of thing. So it's going to be such a blast. We got to investigate with Daryl, what, three months ago? Yeah, I think he was so down to earth and so much fun. It was a really great experience. So I am so looking forward to this. I have a feeling the other ones are that same way. So definitely. And we need to get out of the house again. This is true. A little are... bit of cabin fever. <laughs> exactly. Be thinking about it. November 21st. It's the weekend before Thanksgiving, I believe. It is. On this episode, we're going down and da again. <laughs> Go put some shrimp on the bobby. <laughs> yeah. To the Bogo Road Jail. This one's been on our list for quite some time. It was suggested by two of our listeners, Danica Ellers and Natalie. And apologies to any natives of the area for our poor accents. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I'm saying it right, but it doesn't sound exactly like You're probably not. there because it doesn't <laughs> I know have I'm the not. Australian flair to it. <laughs> Uh, this should be very interesting. Lots of haunts going on there. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, another Kelly. Nice. David, Brian, Christy with a K and an I, Rainy with two E's at the end, Quinn, Deborah, Heidi, Megan, Asha, Alicia, Corrine, who spells her name with a K, Derek, Cindy, Andrew, Daniel, Chrissy with a C-H, Trevor, Rocio, Josh, Nick, and Ken, who we've been ghost hunting with a couple of times now. We have. And thanks for joining us in the crew, everybody. And now, this moment, Noddity. We imagine that most of you have never heard of the rare illness known as Rapunzel Syndrome. No, this is not a disease that makes you burst into song as a man climbs up your hair to rescue you from your tower prison. This is also not a sickness that causes your hair to grow and grow and grow. You get the picture. This is an illness that causes a person to excessively chew on their hair over years, which wouldn't be so bad if not for the fact that they then swallow a bunch of that hair and it tends to build up inside the body. In August of 2020, a 17-year-old named Sweetie Kumari underwent surgery in India. The doctors had found a mass in the teenager's stomach and thought it was a tumor. Imagine their shock when they found a 15-pound ball of hair in her stomach. The doctor said he had never seen that kind of accumulation of hair in the body in his 40 years of practicing medicine. Many people chew on their hair when they are nervous, but ingesting the hair into a ball that one couldn't cough up if they tried certainly is odd. This history podcast 
is haunted. And now, this month in history. In the month of September, on the 12th in 1913, Jesse Owens was born in Oakville, Alabama. He was the youngest of ten children born to a sharecropper. His birth name was James, but he would be known as Jesse from an early age for an interesting reason. His family moved from the South to Ohio, and when Jesse told his teacher what his name was, he said J.C., because his middle name started with a C. And she thought he said Jesse. He developed a passion for running when he was young. Owens first came to national attention when he equaled the world record in the 100-yard dash. He did this while still in high school. Owens took part in the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. He won four medals in track and field there, defeating Nazi athletes, which really angered Adolf Hitler. His world record in the long jump stood for 25 years. While Owens was clearly a gifted athlete, Hitler's Nazi minister Albert Speer wrote that Hitler was, quote, highly annoyed by the series of triumphs by this marvelous colored American runner Jesse Owens. Peoples who antecedents came from the jungle were primitive, Hitler said with a shrug. Their physiques were stronger than those of civilized whites and hence should be excluded from future games. Owen said his success came from letting his feet spend as little time on the ground as possible. From the air, fast down, and from the ground, fast up. Unfortunately, he took up smoking, and lung cancer would take him at the age of 66 in 1980. All right, Kelly, before we jump into this, I have to ask you, are you a crim or a screw? Excuse me? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, A who? A what? There is such a thing as prison slang, and this happens to be prison slang for down in Australia. Okay. A crim is kind of self-explanatory. It's a criminal. Ah, gotcha. A screw, then, is the opposite of that. It would be one of the officers or guards in the jail. Oh, so it's not somebody that's in the jail that got screwed because they were in there for... for yeah, they weren't really guilty or <laughs> yeah. we're not going to talk about any of the other things that go on in prison that that could Oh gosh, I to. wasn't implying that. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about this? The history of Bogo Road Jail is both interesting and troubling. This history goes all the way back to the late 1800s when Brisbane was finally moving from a penal colony to a free community. Many violent offenders came to their ends at the jail. Punishment was dealt out in the black hole. Conditions became so poor that reforms were necessary. Today, the jail is a museum offering tours and there are stories of ghosts on the grounds. Join us as we share the history and hauntings of the Bogo Road Jail. Brisbane was originally inhabited by the Aboriginal tribes Turbal, Kwandamuki, and Ugara. In 1825, the Morton Penal Colony was established for Sydney to have somewhere to send its British convicts. By 1839, the colony was free and many settlers came to partake of the fishing, farming, and timber. The town, which was named for the governor of New South Wales, Sir Thomas Brisbane, grew, and in 1859 it became the colonial capital. Queensland separated from New South Wales and Brisbane became the official capital of the state in 1901. In 1924, Brisbane became an official city. The first jail here was established in Redcliffe, but was eventually moved to the center of Brisbane next to a bend in the river that provided a good natural barrier. There'd be another jail built after this, and that's the one we're featuring. Bogo Road Jail had not been known by that name officially. In 1883, it was Hay Chim Jail, South Brisbane. Then it was Brisbane Prison, and in the early 1970s, it was changed to the Brisbane Prison Complex. And then finally, the Brisbane Correctional Center at the end of its time after reforms were put into place. So how did it come to be known to everyone by this name? When it rained in this area, the track that had been dug out for the road would flood and get very muddy, similar to the quagmire of a bog. The area around this came to be known as Bogo. Thus, the track was given the name Bogo Road. These names started in the 1850s. There are some who believe that the name actually was derived from an aboriginal word, blogo, that meant two leaning trees. 
Whatever the case, the name stuck, even when the track became a street that was named Annerly Road in 1903. The hill upon which the jail was built was originally an indigenous camp. This would be the third jail to be built in Brisbane. The land here was already a government reserve, but it would not be set aside specifically for building a jail until 1880. Robert Porter built the first cell block, and it opened in July of 1883. Sometime later, it would officially be known as Number 1 Division. There were 57 cells originally, and it held only men, but eventually a place for women would be required. A new prison was begun in 1903 for that purpose. There will be other buildings added onto the complex, but this one built for the women was known as the Number 2 Division, and would be the only building to remain standing. This was a hanging jail, and 42 people would be hanged on the grounds which included one woman and two teenagers. The final hanging would occur in 1913, and this would be Queensland's last execution. Ernest Austin was the criminal to have that final honor. Austin had been a child killer. Ernest Austin was sentenced to death in 1913 for the vicious murder and sexual assault of an 11-year-old girl named Ivy Mitchell. This was a heinous crime as he slit the poor little girl's throat. A legend claims that Austin was led to the scaffold, and when he got to the top, he shouted that he was proud of his crime. He then gave a creepy laugh and mocked the people there to watch, and he swore that he would return from the grave. What actually happened is that Austin had been sorry for his crime, and even tried to kill himself before his trial. Several reporters and officials witnessed the hanging when the day came for him to be put to death, and he was administered morphine, and he said to the group, I ask you all to forgive me. I ask the people of Samford to forgive me. I ask that my mother to forgive me. May you all live long and die happy. God save the king. God save the king. God be with you all. Send a wire to my mother and tell her I died happy, won't you? Yes, tell her I died happy with no fear. Goodbye, all. Goodbye, all. One newspaper proclaimed in a headline that the state slays its own creation. It was thought that Austin had been institutionalized for most of his life, moving from a home for neglected children and then eventually on to jail. Another criminal that was hanged here was George Silva, and he was hanged the year before in 1912. He was a mass murderer. Silva worked for a man named Charles Ching. On November 16, 1911, Ching told Silva that he needed to go to town to get some supplies. Silva had taken an interest in Ching's eldest daughter. He made advances towards her on this day, and when she rejected him, he killed the entire Ching family except for Charles, who was away. This was six people. Four of the bodies were in the house. The son Hugh and baby Winnie had their skulls smashed, and the mother named Agnes and the eldest daughter Maud, who was the object of his affection, had been shot by a revolver and a muzzle-loaded rifle. Two other bodies were found a mile and a half away with their skulls smashed, and they'd been shot. I'm wondering if they had run from the house and he caught up to them later? Possibly. Silva eventually turned himself in because he feared a lynch mob. I always love these guys, going and kill these innocent people, and then they're afraid when somebody might kill you. Well, you know, karma's a... Yes, as they say. (laughs) Would have been better if a lynch mob got him, but he did eventually get hanged, so he got what was coming to him. Eventually, in the 1920s, the women would be moved out of the jail, and prisoners from the St. Helena Island Prison in Morton Bay were moved into Number 2 Division. There would be a later building constructed to once again house female prisoners. Number 2 Division became home for the worst of the worst offenders who had long sentences to serve. Three cell blocks were set aside specifically for lifers. These cells seem horrible. The building is made from brick, and there are doors with slits for each cell, so they seem very claustrophobic. Yeah, so we're used to, in a jail, you have bars, basically. Right. Well, this is kind of similar to when we watched Orange is the New Black, and they'd have those rooms that were just bricked in, and you just had a door that opened and closed, and there's a slit in there to slide the food in. That's basically what these look like when I saw pictures of the interior. It would just, ah, I would hate to be locked up in something like that. It'd be pretty horrific. In the 1960s, it was decided that an update was needed to Number 1 Division, and so a new building was constructed around its perimeter, and then the original was demolished. The open oval area left behind was turned into a recreational yard. I thought that was pretty ingenious. I mean, if you're going to build a new building, to build it around the other one, and then you've got this area that's in the middle of that building already set aside. Sure. Use it for a yard. The new jail building was updated with toilets and running cold water in each cell. And this was in the 1960s. It took them to get that. Wow. I was like, whoa. (laughs) Another new feature was the black hole, which was under the oval. This was used throughout the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s for punishment. 
I didn't see any pictures of that, so I don't know what it looked like, but I'm assuming this is like the hole at every other jail where it was some kind of solitary confinement that you got thrown down into, probably no light. Especially if you're considering that the other cells didn't have a whole lot going on as it was, this would have to be even that much worse. And black hole, I'm thinking just dark black. (laughs) I would imagine so. The 1970s would feature a time of great unrest at the jail as inmates started fighting back against the poor living conditions. They staged rooftop protests, hunger strikes, and riots. This got the inmates a lot of attention, and it was warranted as the number two division had not been updated, so there was no sanitation. Inmates still had only buckets in their cells for toilets. Nice little honey pots. Now, I believe that people should be punished for their crimes, but at least give them a toilet that they can go into. Right. They could use, they had, I guess, toilets around in some of the other buildings that they could use during the day. But at night, that's all you had in your cell. And then you'd have to empty it out in the morning. I can't even imagine how bad it would stink in there. The government of Queensland came in and did a survey and were appalled at what they found. They officially shut down the building in 1989. In the 1970s, there were four prisoners who formed some, they were like these wires that they bound up with rubber and made them into these little crosses. And then they would swallow them. And then these crosses would spring open in the stomach. And so you got oh. all these wires that are like, bink. And so it would, you know, scrape up the inside. Yeah. You'd start having all this bleeding and this pain. So then they would have to take them to the hospital oh for God. surgery. And this was a way for the prisoners to get out of jail because they needed to have surgery to remove those crosses. Oh, my word. And I, I thought, how desperate are you just to get out of jail for a little bit of time? Because you're going right back in after you've healed up. And I can't well. imagine that kind of pain. The cross idea came from John Andrew Stewart, who was serving a life term for being one of the Whiskey A Go-Go killers. He underwent surgery five times to remove crosses. He did all kinds of stuff to himself. And since we're on the subject, why don't you tell us about the Whiskey A Go-Go killers? I shall. The Whiskey A Go-Go killers were John Andrew Stewart and James Richard Finch. Whiskey A Go-Go was a cabaret nightclub that was in Brisbane. Do you recognize that name? Of course. Because they have one in California. I know. (laughs) I was like, oh, I'd only ever heard of Whiskey A Go-Go in uh, California. (laughs) The club was firebombed in the early hours of March 8, 1973. Two five-gallon drums of gas were placed in the club's foyer and lit with fire. Carbon monoxide fumes rushed into the main room, and the club was soon a death trap. Bats of used cooking oil were lined against the only escape route, and they were upended as people stampeded through, and eventually it was hard for people to stay on their feet. When they did manage to get outside, they were met with a six-foot-high fence in the alley. There were 50 people in the club, and 15 of them would die. Those that survived jumped from broken windows onto an awning and then dropped the remaining 15 feet onto the ground. There were also windows in the bathrooms that people squeezed through. John Stewart had warned the police that Whiskey A Go-Go was going to be firebombed, so he became their top suspect. An associate of Stewart's named James Richard Finch was arrested. He proclaimed he was innocent but the police said that Stewart planned the crime and Finch lit the fires. Both men would claim during their trials that they had been pressured to give false confessions. Stewart not only swallowed metal objects, he also once sewed his lips shut with wire paper clips. Like I said, he liked to do (laughs) damage to himself. What is the point? (sighs) Finch was a self-harmer, too. He cut off one of his fingers during the trial. Fun fact. (laughs) You gotta love some of my fun facts, Kelly. Fun fact. (laughs) Inmates were photographed holding their open hands against their body to show that they had all their fingers upon entry into the jail. Now, I don't know specifically the reasoning behind it, but I was looking at all these mug shots when they were coming into the jail. And I'm like, why does everybody have both their hands against their chest with their (laughs) fingers spread out? It's the strangest thing. And then I went on to find that it was so that they could prove they had all their fingers when they went in. So I don't know if people would like cut their own fingers off and then claim that they were tortured and possibly the jailers had done it. Yeah, I, I would imagine that probably is where that <laughs> emanated from. Yeah, I just thought that was so weird. I'm like, why would oh, you need gosh. to prove that you have all your fingers before you go in? And why not your toes, too? <laughs> that would have been interesting for mug <laughs> shots. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. That's I'm just terrible. envisioning these amazing mug shots now. Stewart died in jail in 1979 after a six-day hunger strike. Finch was released in 1988 after serving 15 years. The thing that I've always found interesting when they talk about life, whether it's in Europe or down in Australia, it's a lot different than life here because generally speaking, a life sentence with no parole, you are in jail until you die. Right. Life is life. (laughs) But there, usually it's 25 or less is what they serve for life. Wow. Number one division would close in 1992 and all but the C-5 guard tower were demolished in 1996. The women's prison, which was operated for 100 years, was used until 2000 
and then torn down in 2006. And as you heard us say earlier, the only section of Bogo Road Jail that still remains is number two division, and it has been heritage listed. In December of 2012, it was reopened and serves as a museum, offering tours, and there are a variety of tours. They have like an escape tour and different prisoner tours and historical tours. Very cool. And of course, ghost tours too. These are conducted by Bogo Road Jail PTY. There was redevelopment done as well, and this led to the construction of an urban village that was completed in 2010. So if you look at the property, you'd say, well, there's more than just the number two division building there. There's a whole bunch of other buildings. Well, they've developed this urban village that's there, but none of those are any of the original buildings that were once there. Gotcha. So I believe number two division is the only one that you're going to go inside and see the actual cells. Another infamous convict at the jail was Patrick Kenneth, who was Australia's last bush ranger. He and his brother James were cattle thieves. They stole horses and robbed stores as well. But what got Kenneth thrown into Bogo Road Jail was murder. A police posse had set off after the boys after they stole the pony. They managed to capture James, but the rest of the group got away. They later ambushed the two men who made up the posse, and their remains were later found burned up in one of the saddlebags of the men's horses. Yeah, so basically what happened is they find one of the men's horses. These two men are missing. They look in the saddlebags and it looks like there's a bunch of charcoal in there. Lovely. They came to find that, nope, this is not charcoal, it's human remains, and it was for both of those men. I don't know where they put the skulls, because clearly the skulls were not in there since they didn't immediately go, oh, these are skeletal remains. The brothers were sentenced to death, but James's sentence was later commuted to life. Patrick was hanged in 1903. Florence McDonald and her husband Angus were sentenced to death for murdering Grace McDonald. This was later commuted to life imprisonment. She was the first woman sentenced to life imprisonment in Queensland. Florence was known as the stepmother of the long-reach Cinderella. She and her husband kept Grace chained up under the family home, and they deprived her of food. They literally worked the poor girl to death. Florence was released after serving 12 years. To me, that just was not enough. Can you imagine you're sentenced to death, and then all you serve is 12 years? No. Slim Holiday was nicknamed the Houdini of Bogo Road. He escaped from the jail twice, once in 1940 and again in 1946. He tried four other times, but failed. Slim was exactly that, tall and thin. He was a thief and enjoyed breaking into houses. He eventually was caught and convicted in 1939. He was sentenced to five years of hard labor. Slim tried his first jailbreak in 1939 and was busted using a drill to drive out the rivets that held the bolt. Holiday made his first jailbreak on January 28, 1940. He slipped out of line and climbed over a wall and ran for the prison workshop where he had his escape kit. Over several months, he put together a grappling hook that was made out of two wooden hammock sticks, and he attached 30 feet of rope to it that was knotted every 18 inches. There was a spot on the outer wall that could not be seen from the towers. He worked his way over with the grappling hook. It took hours before he was missed, and he was long gone. He was recaptured a week later. His next escape in 1946 was with two other men using a grappling hook again. They were recaptured four days later. Eventually, he was released, but he returned to jail in 1952, a murderer. No, for someone who hated to be in jail, clearly, it's like, why would you go and do something even more heinous than burglary that's going to get you more time? He could not keep his nose clean. We came across a website while searching for ghost stories that denied that the jail was haunted. The author said something along the lines of, even if ghosts were real, why would they be any more prevalent in a jail than any other place? Of course they may not, but we all understand that the higher the levels of trauma, the more likely it is that a location will be haunted. I just thought it was so, you know, when you get these skeptics that are completely skeptical, because of course you and I have our skepticism, but the ones who are like, ghosts don't exist, period, end of story, you can't convince me otherwise. And then they go on to say, well, why would a jail be any more haunted than anywhere else? Well, it's the same thing with an asylum or a murder site or something, because there's more trauma there. And I always think that hauntings are definitely part of energy, whatever that energy was. the higher emotions. The author wrote, The recent television-inspired fad for ghost hunts based on the use of obviously fake ghostometer gadgets has also proved problematic. Such activities have not only been scientifically discredited, but they are clearly disrespectful in a place where people have committed suicide or been murdered within living memory. Relatives of the deceased have strongly expressed their opposition to commercial paranormal industry activities inside Bogo Road. This led to the Queensland government taking the welcome step of banning ghost hunts at the Heritage Prison in 2015. That, to me, is really disappointing because many investigators just want the spirits to tell their stories. Exactly. I mean, you and I, that's why we're going in. I know there's other people who go in and they're being disrespectful. But 
for the most part, the people that we ghost hunt with and our own ghost hunting, we are not disrespectful. Absolutely not. And I think ghosts are at these locations for a reason. And we believe that's because they have a story they need to tell. So let's look at these non-existent ghosts at Bogo Road Jail, shall we? We shall. And like I said, they do offer ghost tours, just not ghost hunts anymore. Gotcha. So, and they they have let a couple of groups in there. I can't remember, but I watched a couple of things on YouTube, but they weren't allowed to take any equipment in with them. It would have worked out good for us because a lot of our experiences have been personal. We don't need the equipment to have had them. This is true. Ghost tours here are hosted by Brisbane Ghost Tours. The child killer Ernest Austin is said to haunt number two division, even though he was hanged in number one division. Prisoners claim to see his face appear outside their cell door. His eyes were filled with darkness, and prisoners claimed that they knew when they looked into those eyes that he had made a deal with Satan. That deal was that he would snatch their souls in exchange for his own. Then the apparition of Austin would come through the door and try to strangle them. This was said to drive a few of them crazy. Haunting Australia investigated the jail in 2015, and they got some interesting evidence. The most evidence came through the spirit box. There were a lot of angry responses and choice words we cannot share here. So I don't know if those were necessarily connected to Ernest Austin or other prisoners. This is just a legend that's told about Austin, but it's one that they would all talk about throughout the years inside this prison. And And it sounds like he was a cuss and cusser. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, because he was sorry for his crime at the end, I, I don't know that he would be making deals with Satan and coming back and strangling anybody. So I think it was just an urban legend. Right. It doesn't sound something really based on reality. If there's one person who knows this jail, it is Jack Sim. If you look up anything about Bogo Road Jail, and then if you look up anything about the ghost there, his name is definitely going to come up. And I love what he calls himself. I'm going to start calling myself this. I bet we have listeners who would like to do the same. He considers himself a dark historian. Ooh, I like that title. Yeah, because we like history. We research history and that kind of thing. But I'm always looking at the dark side of it. Exactly. Seedy side. So I love that. So he is a dark historian, writer, and director of Bogo Road Jail. He shared some ghost stories with the ladies from Haunted Down Under. And if you haven't watched any of their videos up on YouTube, they do an excellent production They have very few uh, views of their videos, which I was shocked to see because it is really high quality productions that they put on. Yeah, I thought it was great. So well done, ladies. Jack himself had seen one of the ghosts that old prison guards used to talk about experiencing. This was the ghost of a former guard who was killed in the jail workshop in the late 1960s known as Birdie. Sadly, he was not supposed to be on duty that day, but he had switched shifts with another guard. An inmate who was incarcerated after being found guilty of multiple murders killed him. Most guards who reported seeing his apparition were working the graveyard shift. It was as though he were still on duty patrolling the place. His disembodied footsteps would be heard many times. Jack saw him standing outside one day, and at first he thought he was some member of the state government security detail named Steve. So he said, hey, Steve, I'll be right out in a second. And then he did a double take because he realized it wasn't Steve. And then the man in the uniform just disappeared. The backtrack that runs the perimeter of the jail property is a type of no man's land. And this is reputed to be the most haunted area of the jail. Which I have no idea. Nobody died back there or anything like that. Or I'm wondering if it's because there's like a rock wall around the perimeter that energy got trapped somehow. Possibly. Do we know what kind of stone it's made out of? I don't. So that would be interesting to find out what that is. I don't know what any of the jails were actually built out of. But it's a really cool looking design on uh, number two division. Most prisoners knew that the jail was haunted, and they knew which specific cells were haunted. They would place bets with each other when a new prisoner would be placed inside one of these cells as to how long it would take before they were begging to be moved. There was only one prisoner to each cell, and Jack was told by a former inmate that one rainy night he awakened and felt as though someone were watching him. He looked to the end of his cell, and there sitting on the floor was a young man. Then he disappeared. Jack related a really scary experience for himself. The doors to the cells are heavy, and Jack had gone into one of the cells that was reputedly haunted one day, and the door slammed shut. He turned and watched the slide bolt move by itself, and he was locked inside. He was all alone. His cell phone and keys were on the lower floor, and no one was expected at the jail for another two days. He started to panic, thinking that he would be locked in there for those two days. Then suddenly, the slide bolt moved again and unlocked the door. The ghosts or ghosts were clearly playing with Jack and trying to scare him. 
And they certainly did. That would be pretty terrifying. I can't even because this is not a place that you could just accidentally get locked into. And then to turn around and be like, you hear the door slam. And then all of a sudden you're watching the slide bolt move. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. Many visitors to the jail have seen the apparition of an older woman in a high neck dress. Some people think that this spirit belongs to Ellen Thompson, the only woman legally hanged in Queensland. She was tried along with her younger lover for the murder of her husband. The judge, Justice Pope Cooper, said the following as he sentenced the two. Prisoner Ellen Thompson and you, prisoner John Harrison, have been found guilty of the crime of murder on evidence which I must say to my mind is quite sufficient. One of the jury has thought to make a recommendation of mercy on the grounds that he is of the opinion that there may have been a quarrel between the murdered man and Harrison immediately preceding the murder. I will, of course, forward that recommendation to the proper authorities. I can give you no more hope than that. That you, Harrison, killed the old man Thompson, I have no doubt whatever. The jury have found that you did so, and I confidently believe that Thompson's wife was present at the time aiding and abetting you. You committed a most cruel murder, and you did it, in my opinion, for the sake of gain. Nothing now remains for me but to pass upon you both the sentence of the law. I have no option in the matter. The sentence that I have to pass on to you, Ellen Thompson, is that you be taken to the place whence you came, and thence to Brisbane Jail, and thence on the date to be appointed by the governor and council, you be led to the place of execution, and that you be hanged by the neck until your body be dead. When people describe seeing Ellen... They say that she is wearing the clothes that she was photographed wearing before she was hanged. Visitors will go into the section of the museum with the gallows displays and swear that they have just seen the woman that is in the pictures there. Female guards did have similar clothes, so it's possible that the spirit belongs to one of them, but we haven't heard of any of them dying at the jail. Yeah, so this is the only woman who was hanged there. So we said, you know, one woman and two teenagers were included in that group of people who were hanged. And she, of course, maintained her innocence to the end. Even her young lover maintained that she was not there. She had nothing to do with it, but they still hanged her. And really, I feel like she probably was very much involved. And I have a feeling that she had had some kind of hold on this young man. Because when you look at the pictures, she was clearly much, much older in her gel picture. And uh, he looked like, you know, a young buck. And maybe he was into cougars. I don't know. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> but I just thought there had to be something else going on here. So I don't know if there was some money involved or something. A little bit of mind ma manipulation. Yeah, possibly. possibly. Like all Jills, this one has a history of interesting characters and infamous inmates. Deaths by suicide and execution were plenty. The emotions that a jail spawns feed negative energy. Is the Bogo Road Jail haunted? That, that is, is for you to, to decide. decide. Well, just another one of those places to check out when we get to Australia eventually someday. I would say probably in my afterlife. <laughs> oh, don't be that way. <laughs> then we'll I get won't, there one day. Then I won't be afraid to be in the air for so many hours. You just boom, boom, fly really fast. Just give you a Benadryl or two. <laughs> yeah, knock, <laughs> knock me out. out. <laughs> we encourage you guys to check out our website at historygoesbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. We heard from a tour guide who is part of the historical haunts in Memphis, Tennessee. Tour guide of tourism. Yes, <laughs> tourism. And uh, she stumbled across our podcast and has really been loving it. And she loves that we're open-minded skeptics here. And she invited us to come and do some tours there. They do a haunted pub crawl, too. Awesome. Sounds like a blast. Yeah. So we're definitely looking to try to get into Memphis Maybe next year. I don't know. We'll have to look at our calendar and see because there's a lot of things that we had to put off this year that we'll be doing next year. Right. Yeah. We so. might not have enough time from work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's Fingers crossed. part we'll of the see. problem. But I, I always think it's so cool when I hear from tour guides or tour guide operators and that they're listening to our podcast because that's basically what we're trying to do is what they're doing, only we're doing it virtually. Absolutely. And definitely supporting them in doing their stuff. A lot of them are having a hard time making it right now. So if you sure. are in an area, make sure that you do the local ghost walk because they definitely need the support. And again, as we said, we do have that ghost hunt coming up in November. Hopefully you can join us for that. October is on the horizon. We've got our anniversary show coming up. We have chosen the winners of the Flash Fiction Contest. We have. So we're looking forward to bringing that to everybody. We're going to have Cemetery Bingo in the first weekend in October. So hopefully you can join us for that. We will have the cards in the Spooktacular crew. So please join us over there. And then, of course, we have our Halloween episode coming up. If you have a real ghost story to share with everyone, please get in contact with us and share that with us so that we can share that with the listeners. Absolutely. I want to thank you guys for joining us for this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. 
Bye bye. This episode isn't brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome back into the cemetery, Rachel Cooper. We're going to be putting you back into your chest tomb and welcome for the first time into the cemetery, Gabrielle Montevecchi. You're going to be placed in a niche wall. Ruth Dempsey, you're going to be placed in a niche wall as well. And Leanne Bennett, we have a chest tomb waiting for you. Thank you so much for supporting HGB. Everyone who isn't aware, our spooky family members that give on Patreon, they're really the ones that bring the episodes to you. So we are so very grateful for them. And here's the thing, Kelly. People really have nothing to lose. Put up your five bucks for the month. You get to look back at the entire archive, which includes over 200 bonus episodes. And if you decide it's not worth it or you just that's all you can afford at that time, you got to uh, get some of the bonus content to listen to and you helped us. So exactly every little bit makes a difference. So we don't expect you to come in and stay forever. I mean, some people have stayed with us for a long time, but any little bit does help us. And we are eternally grateful. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting, and join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. have my glasses <laughs> <laughs> this is an illness that causes a person to excessively chew on their hair <laughs> <laughs> it's very disgusting you need to be in here while i record but ingesting the hair into a ball that one couldn't cough up if they tried certainly is odd no judgment but ew I had heard that before, so it's not completely new to me, but I just, I, I, <laughs> it's hard to wrap my, my brain around that. This is when I am happy that I have short hair, because for me to <laughs> chew on my hair would be pretty much an impossibility. So if I wake up in the middle of the night and my hair is kind of soggy and gummed on, I don't need to look at you. It's probably me. <laughs> More than likely, but maybe, you never know. Maybe I'm missing that element in my life and I've decided to just, you know chomp on some of your hair. Ew. By 1939, the colony was free and men... That's all, folks. You're the one who's always doing the porky pig, so I'm going to throw it in there. By 1839, the colony was free and many settlers... Why can't I say many? I don't know. Cells didn't have a whole lot going on as it was. This would have to be even that much worse. And black hole, I'm thinking just dark black. <laughs> I would imagine so. The black hole. Yeah, it wasn't that. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie from Disney back in the, is it the, it must have been the 80s. I remember seeing it when I was a kid. It scared the crud out of me. The black hole? Yeah. Did you ever see that movie? I don't know. I would imagine I had, but it's not ringing a bell. Yeah, all I remember is seeing it as a kid and I remember being terrified of getting swallowed into a black hole. It was just like when we were kids, we'd pretend like the rocks around our yard were safe, but the grass was lava and right. or, or quicksand. Yeah. And I'm like, where, as kids, what were we watching? That that was Land the thing. Land of the Lost. That, <laughs> like, <laughs> we're terrified of like, we're going to fall into the lava or the quicksand. Probably Land of the Lost. And in Colorado. Watch out we, for the slea stacks. <laughs> Colorado, we didn't have that kind of stuff. But yeah, we got all kinds of crazy ideas. So I think I was afraid of black holes because of that movie, too. There was some robot in it or something that creeped me out. The cross idea came from John Andrew Stewart. Stewart? Who? Stewart? 
I mean, his name starts with the same letters as mine, and I can't get it. <laughs> well. The club was firebombed in the early hours of March 8th, 1973, shortly before I was born. Okay, I was two. <laughs> Actually, I think I was only one and a half at that point. This is true. Vats of used cooking aisle. Aisle? Aisle. It's cooking aisle. I need some aisle. <laughs> what kind of aisle are you going to put in there? <laughs> cook my chicken. <laughs> going to cook my chicken in some aisle. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, we could not make up these bloopers if we tried. <laughs> We're just that good. <laughs> <laughs> We're professionals around here. An associate of Stewart's named Jane. Jean, Jean, Jean. <laughs> Aye, 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 aye. What? His next ex- his next ex- ex-scapes? Ex-scapes. There's too many X's or X sounds. His next ex- I can't Boy, do it. Boy, doing next and escape is really hard. Yes, huh? it is. <laughs> I don't know why. His next escape in 1946 was with two other men using a grappling hook again. I'm not rereading that whole sentence. <laughs> Come on, I want to hear you say next escape, next escape, next escape. Stop it, I'm going to slap you. Just kidding. (laughs) The author wrote, The recent television-inspired fad for ghost hunts based on the use of obviously fake ghost-o-meter gadgets. Oh, is that what that would be? I don't know. When I see it, I, I, I read it as ghostometer. Oh, I don't know. I was just thinking ghostometer sounds more like a oh, ghostometer. Based on the use of obviously fake ghostometer ghostometers, now I can't even <laughs> say that. Ghostometer. <laughs> Based on the use of obviously fake ghost ghostometers. What do you <laughs> ghostometer. say? Ghostometer, like thermometer. Ghostometer. The back track that runs the perimeter of the jail property. Jail property. <laughs> jail. Most prisoners knew that the jail was haunted, and they knew which specific sale. Sales? Sales. They knew which oh, specific Lord. sales were going to go oh on in those God. cells. What were I'm they just selling? I'm just anxious to get out and decorate for Halloween. Tell Come on, what. tell us, Kelly, what were they selling in those jail cells? <sighs> Some of their bucket of honey? Ew. Well, uh, they're honey buckets. Come on. Geez. Is it local? <clears throat> Does it prevent allergies? <clears throat> Ugh. 